Hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah, so my name is Ben. I'm a developer at EasyCater, and uh, we use GraphQL in production. Um, and we had some, we've sort of been developing it over the last year, year and a half or so, and we've come up with some ways so that you know you can develop stuff locally and not break things, and then push to production without breaking things. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we did. Um, I've got some demo apps, um, and they're pretty small, but it's pretty close to what we run in production. Um, and all the code I'll show you at the end of it too. Uh, so GraphQL schema validation. Um, GraphQL gives us the power to easily validate our APIs. So the schema itself is a single written contract that describes the entire API, um, which is very powerful. If we have a copy of that contract, we can ensure our client code is making the right queries and mutations. And we can also compare with newer copies of the contract to analyze potential breaking changes. Um, this is very pow powerful in client app development, especially if you want to develop quickly on, um, in a new client app, or you may not have access locally to your backend services. Um, and you also get some benefits from you know, generating the schema from the server or the backend service that runs it. Um, that's also very powerful. So you always know it's up to date, and there's no more digging into API documentation that could be out of date, worried about like the version that you're looking at. Um, and even that's not really a way of validating things. It's just kind of a document that describes something that may or may not exist. Um, so I'm going to go a bit into what our architecture looks like. It uh, started off very simple. Uh, we'd spin up these React client applications, and they'd point at our Rails monolith, hitting just our GraphQL um, endpoint. Um, and this is sort of how we built out a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. And uh, the new world is where we're kind of putting these proxies in front of uh, the monolith and other services, uh, building out different parts of the ecosystem not as part of the monolith, and finding a way to have our client apps talk to them, but um, not have to know about where all, these, uh, where all this stuff comes from on the back. So I'm going to kind of talk towards the end of it how you might be able to fit some of these practices in, in a world that looks more like this uh, and where we're headed now. Uh, so as far as client code validation, if you're working on a client app, um, linting is pretty awesome for something like GraphQL. Um, and I'm going to show you a bit of what our code looks like for that. Uh, so we load up a sample client app that I have here. I use uh, VS Code. Can everyone see that right here? Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, an app that has some artists and songs that those artists uh, play. Uh, this is what the app looks like. You know, um, uh, Did I not? Maybe I didn't load it up. Um, I'll figure that part out later. But uh, basically, so you have these queries that you define in your application. Um, and with linting, uh, you can get immediate feedback if you do something like type a field wrong. Uh, immediately, we'll underline it and say, tell you there's an error. Can I query this field on this type? Um, and you can, uh, you know, as far as entry points, if you also mistype that, you'll get an error that this isn't a field on our query type. Um, you can also, in something like uh, a query that has arguments or mutation that has arguments, you can uh, verify the types of the arguments. So if I change this ID, this required ID type, to a string, uh, you're going to get you know, some linting errors here where it says this variable of type string is used in a position expecting a type of ID. So that's very powerful. You can validate all of these types specifically when you're doing stuff like a query that has arguments or a mutation. Um, yeah, so how does this all get wired up? Um, we use uh, ESLint, and we configure it with a package, a plugin for GraphQL. So I'll pull up our ESLint RC. And this is basically what it looks like here. Um, we can ignore this schema string part at the top. I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, but basically, we um, define rules for this GraphQL plugin. Uh, one of, and they have a bunch of rules. You can see them in the package. Um, but uh, you know, template strings, you could tell like whether the strings are correct. Um, you could specify sort of Constriction, or you can say, like, I want all the operations to be named, uh, you know, different type conventions, stuff like that. Um, but we're working mostly with this template strings uh, linting plugin here. Um, but to do this, you need um, a schema file to check it against. And in this example, we have, uh, we store that in uh, this GraphQL folder. And so here is an actual copy of the schema that this app is using. Um, and this is where the, the linting comes in. It just sucks this little text thing, this uh, string into the linter, and it can validate all the stuff using this uh, schema. So how do we get the schema into the app? Uh, that was one of the things that we solved in um, sort of the initial world. We had these client applications talking directly to our Rails backend, and uh, I'll go over some of that. So essentially, we have to uh, fetch the backend schema from, from whatever backend you're using. Um, for us, it's Rails. And this is... Um, 
in the Rails controller. I'm not sure if anyone uses Rails, but this is pretty standard if you have a GraphQL implementation in Rails. It all uses the same gem. Um, and you have this execute method that does the execution of the query that comes in. And then we added this uh, schema endpoint. And what it does is it just renders a plain string, and it uses um, some internal stuff. The gem already has this. Uh, GraphQL schema printer. Um, and you pass it your schema, and you call print schema on that. So it just returns a text blob you know, from this endpoint. And what we do in our client application is we have this little bit of code to fetch the schema. Uh, right now it's just configured to run locally, but we actually run this in CI, and it'll hit our production endpoint, and we'll pull a copy of the production schema when we're doing a run in CI, and so we could validate against production data that you're not going to break stuff with your client changes. Uh, but basically all this does is it... Fetches, um, you know, it hits that endpoint. It gets, uh, you know, from the um, the response body, and it compares it to the existing file that's in your um, stash in your application. If they're the same, it does nothing. If they're different, it updates it, and that's it. Really, it's very simple. Um, and I'll kind of show you how that works here. Let's uh, get stuff wired up. Um, so here's my Rails backend. I'll run that server <clears throat> on port 3002. And this is our client application, just npm start. Um, and you actually don't really need the client application running to do this, but I'll show you uh, what the app looks like anyway. So it's just you know a list of artists. It's hitting the back end, it's getting data. Um, so to pull the schema, the schema, sorry, we run an npm run. And I have to find a script in our package JSON just to run that little JavaScript uh, set uh, bit of code. That's a GraphQL pull schema. And what I'm going to do is actually just delete that file. Just kind of show it in action. So we'll delete you. Run our little schema fetcher. And it's pulled it from our Rails backend. And it's stashed it back in our app again. So, you know, we do this locally. Um, you know, you can opt to pull it from like a locally running instance of Rails, or you can pull it from production if you have the right tokens um, to, uh, to do that. Um, so this is a Rails-y implementation. If people have a JavaScript backend, um, I kind of did an example for that too. So let's take a look at that. It's very simple as well. You essentially do the same thing just in JavaScript. Um, so here we have just a very simple JavaScript backend uh, using Express and Apollo server. Um, so this essentially does the same thing. Uh, you create a new Apollo server. You give it um, the type definitions, um, which are in the same sort of deal. You have a schema file that has your schema in it. And uh, you, know, you load that up, run the server, and then we create this endpoint at the same, um, same endpoint, slash GraphQL, slash schema. And this build schema um, takes that string, and it turns it into an executable schema, and then you just call print schema, which is doing exactly the same thing as the Ruby implementation was doing, and it returns that in the response. So now if I spin that guy up, we can sort of see this one in action. Stop the Rails server, and start the JavaScript backend. And let's delete our schema again. And now without changing any client code, we can uh, run the pull schema function again, and we get the schema back in our, in our client app, and we're back to linting again. Um, so that's kind of how we have it set up right now to work. And, um, and this, uh, like I said, for CI, this is great, because you can check the schema in production. And anytime you run a build, you can fail the build if you're going to ship a breaking change from a client app, and as well as just making local development less stressful and easier to reason about. Um, so. Um, in our Rails setup, uh, we do also some checking on the back end. I'm not going to go too much into that because, you know, it's more of a Railsy thing. And we're still trying to figure it out. But there's a gem that will compare two different versions of the schema and bark at you if those two versions have breaking changes. And we're still sort of figuring that one out. Um, we were uh, taking a branch that was being built and compared it against production. We found that was tough when people would merge multiple things into master. If that code wasn't deployed, then the codes above that commit would all break as well. So now we're toying with the idea of having like a central registry for our schemas where we compare versions of the schema um, over time. Still trying to figure that out. So, you know, again, I won't go too much into that. But Apollo has some tooling um, that kind of helps you with this stuff, um, namely Apollo Engine. So Apollo Engine is something that they built. That's a suite of tools that 
does a lot of stuff. It does um, monitoring uh, with all your queries. Um, it has performance stuff that you know, performance analysis uh, for a query for each field in the query. Um, you know, you can have alerts on that. You know, like threshold alerts if you have errors, if you have performance issues, and it also um, has schema validation and history. So you can actually push your schema to like a small proxy that's running an instance of Apollo Engine, and it will record your schema changes over time. So when we get to a world that's more distributed, we're thinking we may have one of these very thin sort of Apollo Engine proxies running in front of each backend. And you know, you'll, each backend just pushes their schema to the little Apollo Engine instance running, and it knows that the, it can do a diff on that schema until you break in changes. Um, so I've got one of those, and I'll kind of show you what that looks like, too. So let's, let's go back to Rails. <clears throat> I'm going to run that on port 4000. And so the um, proxy, the Apollo Engine proxy, is going to run on port 3002, like our backends were previously running at. And our client apps will call into that proxy, and that proxy will just forward requests onto the Rails backend. But it will also be able to collect some information about them at the same time. Um, for Rails to get tracing info on all of these queries and things like that, you have to do a little bit of tweaking with the plugin. Um, you have to add an extra gem. But I believe um, Apollo and or Apollo Server, you can just like flip a flag and it starts adding this sort of tracing data to your to your queries. Uh, so let's start our proxy here. And you have to give it your API key, and then that's it. It spins up, and we load the page. And now we can actually check in our Apollo Engine dashboard, um, kind of just what's going on with our app um, in this in this metrics bit, maybe. <laughs> um, maybe not. Uh, looks like we're having an issue with uh, API key. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, it was working locally. It's not working now, but I can kind of show you. I pushed some other changes to here earlier, so we can sort of see what that looks like. Um, normally, this would be a metrics dashboard. Um, I might actually be able to pull up some metrics when I was doing this uh, earlier. I don't know. It uh, looks like I got to pay. <laughs> anyway, so um, let's look at the uh, history here, and this is sort of what I was getting at. This history is um, every time you push a version of your schema from your backend to this um, Apollo engine, that's this little instance that's running, you get these diffs on what the schema, it stores a version of the schema and it can diff it with a new one that was pushed up. So I did this one um, when I was playing around with it earlier. Uh, this was the initial schema, um, this initial, initial publish, and then I just removed a field on the backend and published the schema. And this is something that would probably happen in like a CI run, um, or you, know, you could even do it locally as like a git hook or something like that. And um, it tells you right away that artist.name was removed. That's a breaking change. So you get this little red X. Um, and you can use this to, um, instead of doing sort of something custom to compare the two schemas, you can wire something like this directly into GitHub. And so they talk about this here in their, um, in their documentation. They have GitHub hooks, you know, they have CI hooks, stuff like that. So you could very easily wire this up to you know, not allow you to merge something in if it has a breaking change or fail a build if it has a breaking change. Um, and that is pretty much it. Um, hopefully our new world, we can start to use some of this pre-built stuff and not have to build schema comparisons by hand. Um, but this is sort of the way we think that we might head with some of this uh, schema validation stuff. Um, I kind of lost track of my slides, but uh, this last bit, um, I have all these slides on uh, my uh, GitHub page and along with all the code from today, so you can run it locally. Um, if you just register, it's, for, it's free for Apollo Engine. You can get an API key and start playing around with some of this stuff yourself. Um, here's the first link is the documentation on Apollo Engine itself. Um, here's the code from today. And then this is, I found this to be like a really helpful post um, on Apollo's blog about different ways to represent your schema. Um, you know, and you could kind of tweak that and use them in different ways if you, know, you need to kind of play around with it. And um, also, you know, Easy Cater is hiring, uh, shameless plug. Um, so that's the last link to get to our hiring page if you're interested. Um, that's it. Thank you.